So, like I said, this is we're basically wanted to kick off a uh, sort of series looking at you know different uh, security issues of past and present, and I thought it would be a good look to start at uh, memory safety. And when I was starting to put this together, you know, I started looking at all these like well-known vulnerabilities and you know which ones dealt with memory safety, and they basically all uh, came down and boiled to the same fundamental aspects. So the talk today is going to look at uh, the issue more fundamentally. Um, I'm gonna cover sort of like the evolution of this and and how we've gotten there and basically focus more on the uh, state of the art techniques uh, for exploitation and give you some examples. So uh, let's dive right into it and begin by talking about the origins of memory safety. Uh, so memory safety and general computer security all really started to catch people's attention way back in the late 80s. The Morris worm was pretty much the first virus to hit the internet or the ARPANET as it was known in those days. And it caused disruption on a scale that was never seen before. And it started when Robert Morris, a uh, graduate student at the time, uh, simply wanted to highlight security flaws in systems. And he started this as a benign in, with benign intent, and it resulted in the first felony conviction in 1986 under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So it got a little bit out of hand. And essentially, the worm worked by exploiting vulnerabilities in various Unix programs, much like modern systems. And in fact, it's one of the first well-known programs that exploits buffer overflow vulnerabilities. So if we fast forward now to 2014, not too long ago, you probably all remember Heartbleed. And while this is not a virus or an exploit per se, this vulnerability had serious repercussions. And to this day, there are still some odd 90,000 servers on the internet that remain vulnerable. Essentially, Heartbleed made what were otherwise secure cryptographic protocols mute, allowing for stealing cryptographic secrets that were used across the internet. So, what was this vulnerability? Well, it wasn't much different from the Morris worm just 26 years earlier. And I think this XKCD has the best explanation for what memory read or memory leak vulnerability, such as Heartbleed, is. So basically, you have a server where you request a message for a specified length. And because the length isn't checked by the, uh, by the server, the attacker asks for more data than what is normal. And this is what's shown on the second panel. Now, this allows the requester, and in this case, the attacker, to read past the original message and tricks the server into leaking information that they shouldn't have access to. Yeah. Now, I bring these up uh, because, like I said at the beginning, these events are spread apart by over two decades worth of technological advances yet the fundamental vulnerabilities have remained the same across time. And this mainly boils down to the fact that low-level languages, such as C and C++, which are unsafe, still remain incredibly popular. Here, they're shown in the graph in the light orange and the light blue. Uh, and perhaps the biggest reason why this topic of memory safety remains relevant today is that most of the critical software that exists is written in C and C++. Now, low-level languages like C and C++ trade type safety and memory safety for performance, which in, this, in many domains is critical. And with great performance comes great memory responsibility. And as many of you are aware that have programmed in these languages, it's quite easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Now, to put into context just how common these threats are, Let's consider that over 70% of all CVEs in Microsoft products each year are memory safety related. And open source software doesn't actually fare much better, with over 29% of bugs found by Google's OSS fuzz being memory safety related. Now, what has made and continues to make this issue so prominent is the fact that attackers love to exploit these memory safety vulnerabilities. This is data about the CVEs exploited in Microsoft products 
uh, again, and it shows that the overwhelming majority are memory safety related. So up until now, I've kept talking about this problem of memory safety, but you know, what is it really? So I want to describe a, a simple formalization of it uh, to help us guide us in this uh, journey. So now let's consider the following C code. Here we have a struct definition on the left, A sub T, and a set of heap allocations on the right. Now formally, we can break down memory safety into two components. The first part is a spatial component. That means that for an allocation, you know its layout or bounds. And this is typically what you hear of when you have a stack or a heap overflow, right? It means you violate this uh, spatial condition. The second component is the temporal aspect. And this pretty much amounts to knowing when and where an allocation is going to be valid. And the typical things that you hear about this are, you know, the dangling pointers and use after free. This is how this is these falls under the temporal category. Now, with this formalization out of the way, some of you might be wondering if memory safety can be described so simply, then why is it still a problem? Why haven't we actually solved it? And to a large degree, we can argue that we've quote unquote partially solved it. Uh, meaning there are safe languages that provide memory safety and type safety, for example, Java, Python. But there are many defense mechanisms that have been researched and proposed for low-level languages like C and C++. However, none of them have really seen widespread use except for a select few like ASLR, uh, DEP, Stack Canaries, and most recently, different forms of uh, CFI or controlful integrity. Now, without getting too much into the exact details, many other defenses have failed, tended to fail, due to high performance overheads, costly implementation, and a general lack of compatibility with existing legacy code bases. So it's not to say that there hasn't been any progress on memory safety. It's just that it's pretty much turned into a cat and mouse game. Now, to put this into context, here we have a timeline, courtesy of my colleague Mohammed, which you can find linked on the bottom left. Uh, and I encourage you to check out his presentation with a deep dive more on this timeline. Now, this timeline accurately, accurately captures just how attackers and defenders have kept moving the goalposts on each other. So most importantly, it highlights how attackers keep finding new ways of exploiting the same fundamental flaws since defenses haven't been comprehensive enough due to the issues previously discussed. Now, to understand how attackers have managed to bypass all the defense mechanisms that have been developed, we need to better understand the steps that they take at a more fundamental level. And this is where this memory attack model by Zakaris et al. summarizes it. In fact, I encourage everybody to read this paper as it's pretty good for and very accessible for anyone with an appreciation of security. Essentially, this flow diagram describes all the different ways in which a memory safety issue can be leveraged by an attacker and how it leads to different classes of exploits. And we're going to take a look at the bottom, which are the exploit categories. Now, unlike the underlying memory safety flaws, the level of sophistication to mount these different categories of attacks has greatly increased over the past decades. In other words, the defenses that have been adopted have actually raised the bar for the attacker. Ultimately, the complexity of these partial defenses has resulted in this evolutionary ordering of attack techniques. Now, from a fundamental aspect, some of you may be wondering uh, why defending against one type of attack is more difficult than others if essentially it's the same underlying vulnerability. Now, at a high level, I want you to consider the following ask yourself, what is necessary to prevent an information leak? Knowing, essentially, you need to know what data is sensitive. Next, ask yourself, what is necessary to prevent code corruption? Well, you need to know which code regions are supposed to be executable. Next, what is necessary to prevent control flow hijack? You need to know the valid execution paths that the program may take. And finally, what is necessary to prevent data-only attacks? 
you need to know the flows of data and the values of data. In other words, the levels of knowledge required for protection increases, thus making these defenses more complex. Now today, the state-of-the-art exploitation techniques fall into data-only category. And how do these work conceptually? Let's go back to the attack model. Now starting from the top, at, at step one, let's say that we have uh, some pointer that can cause uh, you to go out of bounds. In other words, you have a spatial violation. This is steps one and two. Now this allows you to corrupt a data variable, violating the integrity of memory in steps three and four. The program then uses these corrupted data values resulting in chaos, essentially at step five. Now at a high level, this seems intuitive enough. However, there are quite a few details to carry out these attacks. And this will be the focus of the rest of this talk. Now there are two classes of data only attacks. The first is categorized as direct data manipulation. Here, an attacker directly manipulates the target data to accomplish the malicious goal. It requires the attacker to know the precise memory address of the target non-controlled data. For instance, in the example on the right, we have a vulnerable function called packet read, which can directly corrupt the variable isAdmin located right above which can be used to enter the if condition and run privilege privileged code. So, okay, you might be thinking, this seems like everything needs to line up in order for this to work. And it seems pretty limited, right? So the question is, can we do more? And this brings us to the second category of data only attacks known as data oriented programming or DOP. Now DOP, allows an attacker to perform arbitrary computations in program memory by chaining the execution of short sequences of instructions referred to as data-oriented gadgets or DOP gadgets. Now the idea is to reuse the code in these gadgets for malicious purposes other than the developer's original intent. Now if this sounds familiar, for those of you who didn't catch the, my first talk on Rob last year, let me give you a quick refresher. So back on DOP, uh, what we have here is a control flow graph, or CFG as it's commonly referred to, of, the, of a program on the left. And on the right, we show the stack. Now in a ROP attack, essentially you use the memory vulnerability to corrupt the return address on this stack in order to change the control flow of the program. Now in this example, we basically made a function Z, which was dead before, become active by introducing a new path to it. Now going back to DOP, let's understand how much more sophisticated it actually is from a logical perspective. So note here, I've augmented the edges of the control flow graph showing a da the data dependence between them. And on the right, instead of showing the program stack, we now show the program's data. We can see the values of v and do loop on the right. Now, as you might imagine, as the data of the program changes, it will traverse the different paths of this graph, all of them which are considered valid control flows. So, say if an attacker is able to corrupt the values in memory, they can modify the path the program takes, all while adhering to valid control flows Basically, this is what allows it to bypass control flow integrity techniques, which are the newest type of enforcement that has been widely deployed. Now, with this intuition in mind, let's get a little bit more technical. So here on the left, we have a vulnerable server program. Now, as a prerequisite, we have a memory safety vulnerability. In this case, a stack buffer overflow in the function read data. Now the attacker's goal is to have the code on the left simulate the malicious code on the right. So the question is, how do we do that? Now similar to ROP, an attacker needs some building blocks. Here we highlight these key building blocks or the DLP gadgets that are required for this attack. And we'll briefly look at one of these gadgets to get an intuition of how everything is going to be stitched together. So let's focus on the load gadget, which is probably the simplest one. Uh, so 
in green is the actual code that is written in the program, the actual gadget. And on the bottom is equivalent pseudo assembly for the operations that it's going to perform. On the right, we have two memory locations uh, that the pseudo assembly instructions one and two are going to load from. It's easy to see how this is a load, given that the instructions move memory into these virtual registers. Now at instruction three, the memory in blue is loaded to where the gray box used to be. In other words, it works in a similar manner. Always, other gadgets work in a similar manner, sorry, uh, and are always operating in memory. In other words, what DOP does is actually emulate another machine in memory, not dissimilar to say how an emulator works. Now with this in mind, let's get back to the code. So here, we have the purple arrow uh, on the top left. It's going to mark our current instruction where we begin at a gadget dispatcher, which is the one in yellow. Uh, the box below represents the memory space of the program and how uh, different uh, memory locations are pointing to different addresses. Uh, in the dark gray is the buffer followed by the stack variables. And this is the region that we will overflow. In the white, are the memory addresses on the heap. And remember, the goal is to turn the code on the left to the code on the right, which is the malicious program. Now we have an overflow that happens in read data. We overflow the buffer within the addresses such that the stack variables now point to where the red arrows indicate. That is type list, type points to list, uh, size points to add in, and now serve points to size. Next, you reach the first DOP gadget, which is a conditional DOP gadget. We see that the star type, aka the list, does not equal null on the right, so we jump to the else branch. Here, the serve variable is now pointing back to size because it wants to point to basically itself in order to dereference the uh, arrow type that we will set it to. This is what's shown in the dashed uh, box. Now, serve is set to list next. And because serve points to list next, we can see that dereferencing total will actually access prop, which is exactly what we want next. We continue in a similar fashion for the rest of the computation. essentially until we finish and simulate the malicious code. Now, From the example, you might have already figured out that the while loop and the read data are particularly important. This is what's highlighted in the bottom in yellow. Now, in combination, these two are called the gadget dispatcher. And this dispatcher is what allows the attacker to chain these gadgets, these DOP gadgets, that conform to the program's legitimate control flow. It involves two components, the loop and the selector, like I said. The loop allows us to repeatedly invoke these gadgets, and the selector allows us to activate the sets of gadgets within each iteration. Now, in the paper, the authors prove that DOP is, in fact, Turing complete, much like ROM. And here's the snapshot of what they refer to as the MinDOP language. Now there are six kinds of virtual instructions, each operating on these virtual register operands, like I mentioned earlier. The first four are your typical arithmetic, logic, assignment, and load store operations. And the last two are conditional and unconditional jumps that allow the implementation of control flow uh, within the MinDOP virtual program. Now, much like ROP, each virtual operation is simulated by real instruction sequences that are available in the vulnerable program. With this conceptual stuff out of the way, we can dive into some code that I've set up for all of you guys to play around with and learn some more. Uh, you can find it at the link uh, here, and uh, you can check it out after the talk if you're interested. As an extra, I've also updated the DOP gadget compiler, as it's referred to in the original paper, uh, to work with a more modern version of LLVM. 
uh, so you can find gadgets in real world programs. Now, let me just give you a brief explanation of the various things that you'll find in this repo. You'll find a vulnerable server written in C, which is pretty basic and uses a simple binary protocol over a regular network socket. And I put a ton of comments in, so it should be fairly easy to follow. Uh, I've also written a small Python API wrapper to interface with the server so you can write uh, the exploit code easier. And then lastly, there's the actual exploit code. Uh, and there's a different a number of different modes and features, so you can check out the README. Uh, and I'll cover some of them later and a little bit more on the technical details during a small demo. Uh, now, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll talk about one mode uh, which leaks a secret variable in the program. And the exploit basically works in three steps. You first need to find the address which holds the secret. You use a DOP gadget to load and fetch the secret. And then you finally exfiltrate the secret back through the network. So this is basically the relevant bit of code that you'll need to focus your attention in the file in the repo. And it's I've modeled it very similar to the original code in the in the top paper, so it's easy to follow along. And you'll have a vulnerable read and data function and the top load gadget, just like in the example. Now, the actual Python code that exploits the code is quite straightforward. Uh, the secret, which is value leet, is stored in a global variable named GPP secret. Uh, and we'll use a dop load gadget to load it into another global variable GA. When we will then trigger the server's get type request, which directly reads from GA. And this is how we will leak the secret. Now, the equivalent C statements for this process, process are highlighted by the comments in pink. And note that there's no need to disable any you know, security mechanisms like ASLR for any of the exploits uh, to work, as there's a built-in mechanism to leak the base address within the program's address space. So with that, let me just quickly switch to uh, the actual here. I guess we don't need this. Okay, so I provided a Docker container that you can uh, you guys can uh, launch this with no compatibility issues. So this is what I have here launching on the first tab. Uh, on the second tab, uh, I have already logged in uh, logged into this Docker container, uh, and we're going to quickly make the vulnerable server, and then we're going to launch it. You can just pass in the port that you expect it to be running in. Now, in the third tab here, I have launched another terminal session into this container. And we have what's called the exploit runner, which is what's going to actually uh, run the code. So it has a bunch of different options uh, that you can play around with. And for this demo, essentially, the way it works is you need to pass in, if you want it to work on any arbitrary machine, you need this uh, dash dash GDB flag, which uh, looks at the program symbols in order to get the corresponding addresses so that it can then calculate uh, reliably what the addresses are when it's loaded when using ASLR uh, so that you can uh, reproduce this very easily. And we're going to run the DLP secret leak. And basically, you'll see it launches the, the attack. And we can see that the uh, leak happens. And I don't know if I can increase the code, the font here. Oh, yeah. So like I showed in the slide, this is pretty much the relevant code uh, that runs and the equivalent statements uh, in C. Let me switch back to the slide. Okay, so here I've linked uh, a few additional resources uh, 
the fun basically doesn't stop with just DOP. There's also BOP, and uh, which is a more, uh, how should I say, an evolution. It's basically an evolution of BOP that is more uh, robust in some sense. It uses whole basic blocks instead of just uh, instructions. Uh, and you can follow the links here below uh, when I distribute the slides later uh, to read up more about it. And the other reference that I want you guys to check out is this uh, survey on data-only attacks, which uh, compares a bunch of different uh, defensive techniques to protect against them. Now, to basically get to the last tier of the talk, I'm going to basically touch upon the state of memory safety going forward. Now, one of the most promising defenses by far for a majority of systems seems to be ARM's pointer authentication, or as it's commonly known, PAC. It's currently deployed in Apple devices with the A12 Plus chips. And time will tell, basically, if it's robust enough as we expect it to be in theory. So the way it works is uh, PAC aims to encrypt pointers, which thwart most exploit techniques, and gets as close to true memory safety as we've gotten thus far. Control flow attacks, DOP attacks, and many other data-oriented attacks rely on the manipulation of vulnerable pointers. Consequently, ensuring pointer integrity prevents these attacks. Put simply, if you can't corrupt the pointers, then you fail at step one in the attacker model that we that I showed before. So I'm just going to take a very brief look at how this works to uh, so that you can see how uh, the state of things. So it works by tagging pointers with an authentication code in the higher order bits of the address space, which are typically unused. Usually only 48 bits of the virtual address space are used, which leaves the remaining 16 bits to be used for other purposes in the meantime. The PAC is a message authentication code, so a MAC. You've probably heard of HMAC. And this MAC is calculated over the pointer value with a modifier or a context uh, as a, a tweak. Now, different combinations of these key and context pairs allow domain separation among different classes of authenticated pointers. Now, this prevents authenticated pointer values from being arbitrarily interchangeable with one another. This prevents, for example, attacks from using a function pointer as a return address or vice versa. Uh, it's worth noting that the idea of using Max to protect pointers at runtime is not really just new to ARM's pack. Cryptographic CFI, which was developed at Stanford, uses Max to protect control flow data, such as return addresses, function pointers, and vtable pointers. The difference between uh, it and PAC is mainly in the integration with the hardware. Unlike ARM PAC, CCFI uses x86 hardware accelerated uh, AES and I instructions for speeding up MAC calculation. It then performs runtime software checks to compare the calculated MAC address to the reference value. PAC, on the other hand, uses either Karma or some other manufacturer specified MAC and performs this comparison, the MAC comparison in hardware. Other than hardware, we also have languages uh, such as Rust, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, now, the reason these are interesting is that it has reasonable performance overheads while still providing you know, stronger memory safety guarantees than C and C++. But it's still unclear just how much of a benefit it will actually bring. Uh, so for those that haven't looked into Rust, it has this unsafe keyword that allows you to basically bypass all of its checks. Uh, and it actually turns out, at least according to this uh, paper that I've linked here, that uh, it may be more common than we think. So I encourage you guys to check out their analysis on, uh, on this. Now, finally, in order to help eliminate memory safety bugs, sanitizers and fuzzers have been shown to be a promising approach to identifying and eradicating these troublesome bugs. We've already had a good workshop on fuzzers, so actually maybe a good follow-up is on sanitizers and how they work. Now, in conclusion, memory safety is going places, and there has been great progress in the last few years. 
But in the post-meltdown in Spectre world, we must be careful as we tread forward. Many of the sa memory safety defenses may not cover these hardware side channels, which can be used to render them moot. Now, this is a topic worth devoting yet another entire presentation to, so I won't touch upon it here. But I'll point you to this talk from earlier in this year, before the whole pandemic, uh, for a good relatable example of using hardware side channels to bypass mitigations in modern browsers. Now, going forward, I think we should keep in mind that we need to develop defenses that are, one, comprehensive enough to protect against threats from both software and hardware and are composable with each other and other def like other defenses that exist, whether it be only targeting hardware or only targeting software. So pretty much uh, that's what I had set up, and um, I wanted to open up for more discussion and what you guys think we should uh, uh, focus on and do the actual deep dive on uh, more interesting uh, vulnerabilities and exploits in the future. So yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, thank you very much, Miguel, for the talk. It was great. Uh, I have a question regarding, uh, in your experience, how uh, common is this kind of vulner vulnerabilities in uh, book bounty platforms such as HackerOne or, you know, Hacker, Hacker uh, sorry, HackerOne and BookCrowd? Like, it is common there or? Like, because I'm assuming the companies need need to give you like the binaries, right? And usually it's like more like web platforms. So I'm not too familiar with the, the platforms. I know that uh, HackerOne and, you know, uh, what's this called? Zerodyne, I think is the other company that buys zero day exploits and whatnot. They look for, you know, uh, this type of stuff. And essentially the vulnerabilities exist everywhere uh, in terms of all, uh, whether it be a web uh, browser or a JavaScript engine, they're all written in C and C++, so they exist. The exploit technique, I'm not sure that it's being publicly documented uh, in the wild, meaning it hasn't been malici maliciously used that I know, it's only been discussed ac ac academically. Cool, great, thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so the the memory uh, issues in C C plus plus exist forever and uh, um, unfor continue to exist. Uh, how popular? How how often this kind of attacks happen? Because to do some kind of what you just showed. You have to have an access to to the hardware, actually, right? Uh, what do you mean by access to the hardware? Well, I I do need access to to substitute to exploit your memory your memory vulnerabilities. I need to be able to push my code into your stack. No, 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 you no, don't. That's, really. the whole, okay. that's the whole thing. Um, and in terms of, you know, the popularity of or the availability of these uh, memory safety issues, this, this is data from, you know, as recent as last year for Microsoft and the Google OSS Plus data that I have is from 2016 to 2018. Uh, so over 70% of Microsoft products, CVEs reported are memory safety related and the CVEs that they log that are actually exploited, again, same uh, high percentage 75%. are uh, memory safety. Yeah, uh -huh. so they are common. But but there are tools to, I mean, for those languages, C, C++, we have uh, all grinds, we have uh, all kinds of tools and then serious codes, you have, that as a part of your uh, deployment of your this release. Is what, this is what fuzzers essentially are doing nowadays, right? And they've helped tremendously, but you know they still can't find all types of uh, memory safety violations. And you know not only 
can they not find it because of they're not designed to find them, but also because they just don't reach the search space uh, in a given amount of time that is budgeted uh, when these systems are run. So they will still be out there. Unbelievable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I've been I've been fighting with those bugs for my entire career, which is a couple of decades, and uh, well, nothing changed. Thank you, Miguel. Not very good no presentation. Problem. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question by Sunil. What do you think OGF secure enclaves? I guess he means of secure enclaves. So yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, and that falls more into the you know, hardware vulnerability uh, side of things. I think that most uh, I guess attacks and against them have been hardware side channels and whatnot, which essentially break down all the assumptions that they're built on. Uh, so I don't know how, at least the current designs, I don't know how useful they are, but yeah, that's probably worth discussing, uh, in, in a hardware, uh, exploit and vulnerability, uh, talk we can give. Yeah, it was about Intel SGX technology of secure enclaves. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much, Miguel. Yeah, it was a great talk. We're gonna uh, dive deep into the slide deck. And also we're gonna most probably watch the uh, slides of this presentation again on YouTube to uh, follow all, all the steps again. Yeah, and, and if anybody has suggestions as to like what else we should talk about in this, uh vulnerability and exploit technique session, you know, definitely shoot uh, messages on the Slack chat, on the Slack group. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. It was a great session. Yeah, good questions, everybody. Thanks.